Good afternoon, I'm Josh Aldrich. I'm joined by Administrative Law Judges Keith Long and Andrew Wong. I want to welcome everyone to the Office of Tax Appeals Afternoon Calendar. This is the last hearing for today and the calendar year. Uh, today's oral hearing for the appeal of G. Ramirez and P. Ramirez doing business as the Kennedy Store and Delhi will be live streamed and transcribed. Our stenographer, Ms. Alonzo, is here. Uh, she is reporting this hearing verbatim. To ensure that we have an accurate record, we ask that you speak one person at a time. And please be sure to speak directly into the microphone. If needed, the stenographer, Ms. Alonzo, may stop the hearing process and ask for clarification. She may also ask you to slow your rate of speech. After the hearing, uh, the stenographer will produce the official hearing transcript, which will be available on the Office of Tax Appeals website. To help the hearing run uh, smoothly, please state your name before you speak. Please remember to be professional. For example, do not interrupt each other. Please use appropriate language. Please mute your microphone if you are not actively speaking. Uh, once again, these proceedings are being broadcast live and uh, any information shared is publicly viewable. Should someone lose their connection, my panel members or I may pause uh, the hearing to address a connectivity issue. And once we go on the record, we will confirm the issue or issues is in this case, go over the exhibits and address other matters. With that said, are there any questions before we go on the record? Uh, Mr. Armijo? No, I have no questions. Okay, and Mr. Suazo? No questions. Great. Madam stenographer, are you ready to proceed on the record? Got a thumbs up. And for my fellow ALJs, thumbs up. Great. This is Judge Aldrich. We are opening the record in the appeal of G. Ramirez and P. Ramirez doing business as the Kennedy Store and Delhi before the Office of Tax Appeals. OTA case number 18103890. Today's date is Thursday, December 29th, 2022, and it's approximately 2.30 p.m. This hearing was noticed for a virtual hearing and is being heard by a panel of three administrative law judges. My name is Josh Aldrich. I am the lead for purposes of conducting the hearing. I'm joined by judges Keith Long and Andrew Wong. During the hearing, the panel members may ask questions or otherwise participate to ensure that we have all the information needed to decide this appeal. And after the conclusion of the hearing, we three will deliberate and decide the issues presented. As a reminder, the Office of Tax Appeals is not a court. It is an independent appeals body. The panel does not engage in ex parte communications with either party, and our opinion will be based off the party's arguments, the admitted evidence, and the relevant law. We have re read your your submissions and we're looking forward to hearing your arguments today. Uh, who is present uh, for the appellant? Mr. Armijo, could you start? Sure. Um, well, um, first of all, um, good afternoon and and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to have this uh, to have this hearing. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, is introduce uh, the um, uh, the Ramirez's. Um, yeah. Here behind me is. Uh, Gilbert Ramirez. Patricia Ramirez. Thank you. And, uh, yes. And then, and of course, uh, myself, um, Oscar G. Amico, CPA. So I, I just wanted to give you a little bit of uh, uh, brief It sounds like you're switching into your presentation. I'm just trying to get uh, who the oh. parties are uh, at this okay. moment. All and right. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of lead way or lead That's into fine. your presentation. I'm sorry. <clears throat> but, and apartment, um, who's here for CDTFA? Uh, this is Randy Suazo, hearing representative. Jason Parker, Chief of Headquarters Operations Bureau. Christopher Brooks, Tax Counsel for CDTFA. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to talk about what the issues are. Um, those were memorialized on the minutes and orders, but uh, Mr. Armijo did uh, indicate that they were disputing the negligence penalty, so there are technically two issues. I'll read them uh, just briefly. Whether appellant has shown that further adjustments are warranted to the audited understatements of reported taxable sales and whether the negligence penalty was properly imposed. Uh, does that sound about right, Mr. Armijo? Uh, that's correct. Okay, and apartment, Mr. Suazo? That is correct. Great. Uh, so next we're gonna talk a little bit about exhibits. Uh, so CDTFA's exhibits are identified alphabetically as exhibits A through F. 
they were submitted timely, and uh, during the pre-hearing conference, Mr. Armijo indicated that he had no objections to admitting them. Is that still true, Mr. Armijo? Yes. Okay. Uh, hearing no objections, we'll move those into evidence. And then uh, uh, Mr. Armijo uh, submitted an exhibit index identifying exhibits A through G on December 14th. Um, and to avoid confusion while we're discussing them, um, uh, we will relabel them as exhibits one through seven. So exhi appellant's exhibit A will now be exhibit one, appellant's exhibit B will now be exhibit two and so forth. Um, and the reason why I'm doing that is because uh, CDTFA has their exhibits uh, labeled as A through F and I don't, uh, um, don't wanna cause confusion. But uh, if, uh, Mr. Armijo, if you uh, refer to it as uh, your exhibit uh, A, just be, uh, if you could clarify that it's appellant's exhibit A, but it'd be more helpful if you could uh, refer to it numerically. But um, I also indicated on those uh, minutes and orders, we uh, discussed any objections to admitting those exhibits. Mr. Suazo, did you have a, a objection to admitting appellant's proposed exhibits? No objections. Okay, so, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, uh, the uh, appellant's exhibits one through seven, formerly A through G, are admitted into the evidence. Um, to get to let everybody know how the the hearing will proceed, um, we have we're going to start off with appellant's uh, appellant's opening presentation. Excuse me, and we estimated that was sixty minutes long. Uh, next, uh, we'll have CDTFA's combined opening and closing statement for approximately twenty five minutes. And then the panel will ask questions for about five to 10 minutes. Uh, following that, there'll be an opportunity for appellant to uh, provide closing remarks or rebuttal uh, for about five to 10 minutes. And uh, like I indicated before, these are estimates made for calendar purposes. If you need additional time, or if you wish to waive time, please let me know and I'll address your request. Uh, next, uh, we'll switch to uh, witness testimony. So, Mr. Suazo, is it still correct that CDTFA does not intend to call a witness? You're muted, sorry. This is Mr. Suazo. Uh, this is Randy Suazo. No witnesses. Great, thank you. And Mr. Armijo, uh, I believe you have two witnesses today? Correct. Um, and um, so since I'm not sure at what point in your presentation you're going to be uh, having the uh, witness testimony, I'm going to go ahead and uh, swear them in now. If uh, Mr. Ramirez and Mrs. Ramirez could please raise your right hand. Uh, do you swear or affirm to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. Yes. Okay, I heard two verbal yeses. Um, um, Ms. Alonzo, did you hear those as well? You good? All right. There's just a little bit of faint. So, um, so it sounds good. Um, are there any questions before we transition to presentations, uh, Mr. Armijo? No, I have no questions, sir. And Mr. Suazo? No questions. All right. Uh, so, Mr. Armijo, uh, please um, uh, proceed with your opening presentation um, when you're ready. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, so um, what I like to do is start off by just giving you a very brief um, uh, um, introduction of myself and, and my, my work experience and, 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 um, and you know, what I do and what we've done here in the firm. So we've been in practice for over 35 years. Uh, most of my experience has been related to conducting audits of, of um, uh, organizations, uh, nonprofits, businesses, uh, government units, districts, and special districts. Uh, so um, I say this because I wanted, um, um, you know, I, 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 I wanted to, uh, you to understand that, uh, that when we talk about auditing procedures and when, when, when we talk about um, um, the uh, auditing standards that, that you know that I understand what exactly it is. Uh, and, and um, you know, our firm has been subjected to many peer reviews, uh, over 10 of them, and uh, we have passed every one of them. So um, so I have an extensive experience in, in, in conducting 
different type of audits. Um, so, um, but what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna give you a very brief presentation of the things that I'm gonna be discussing, and then we'll get into it uh, in more detail as we go through, as we go through the exhibits. Um, first, um, um, the, um, the, uh, one of the objections and, and one of the, uh, um, one of the um, issues that we had is, is throughout this process is, is how the, how the audit was conducted. Okay. And, and uh, in one of my exhibits, and that would be exhibit one, I included a, an audit report, which is not related to the, uh, to the audit period that we're, you know, with the, that we are appealing. Uh, that was the, uh, the first audit that was, that was conducted on, on my client for the, uh, for the years 2008 and 2010. And, and um, you know, we, uh, you know, I, just to be very brief, uh, that, was a, um, that was a total surprise to my clients. Uh, you know, the, um, the process that was supposed to be followed in notifying the client about the, about the, uh, about the audit and actually, um, you know, uh, conducting the audit and everything that has to be done, none of that was done. In fact, the report that was issued on that particular audit was actually not even um, uh, provided uh, to my client until we started the audit for 2011, 2013. That report was actually handed over to us when we had our first interview with, uh, with the auditor at their offices in here in, in Rancho Mirage which was a total surprise to me. And it made a lot of sense because uh, some of the money that, 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 the, uh, uh, that the audit report said that they owed was actually garnished from my client's account. And, you know, we didn't realize, or they didn't realize that that had happened um, um, until, you know, we started preparing the financial statements and I saw this large, you know, withdrawals from their accounts. I said, well, what, what's going on here? And anyway, so they weren't able to provide any, you know, information about that until, you know, we started to investigate this. And then when we got the report, then we realized that that tax liability had been paid through garnishment. And, and um, I really don't understand how that happened. You know, they were not my clients at that point, at that, at that point but it happened, okay? So when we started the audit for uh, 2011, 2013, uh, the first thing that the auditor, the field auditor that, that came in to do the audit, that told us, he said, hey, you know, um, um, we're doing this because you had a lot of, a lot of issues with the uh, 2010, 2000, uh, 2008, 2010 audit. And so, um, but, um, you know, I've, I've, he says, I realized that there was some lack of communication and the way I'm not going to do that, you know, we're going to have uh, full disclosures and we're going to be in communication at all times and there'll be no surprises. So, um, so we, you know, this is how I intend to conduct the audit. Uh, for the most part, uh, that's actually how it happened. I mean, um, he was very uh, cordial. He was very uh, um, responsive and, and, um, you know, until we got to the point where, you know, he gave us his preliminary findings. And that's when we kind of disagree, you know, on, on, on the findings. And, and um, so, but, you know, I asked him, I said, well, why, you know, uh, I said, why, you know, they, why are you doing this audit? He said, well, because, you know, this is something that we, you had problems before, so we're just following up. And, you know, I guess that's practice. Uh, that you guys follow uh, when you conduct audits and there's a problem. And I believe them because I had another audit for another client and, and, and there was a case too. There was an audit and then there was a subsequent audit after that. So, you know, I, I, I had no problems. But one of the things that he told us is, well, you know, I don't agree on, on some of the conclusions that were um, actually arrived at. And, and I said, well, look, I can't really speak to that because I never seen the audit report. So I'm not really sure what, what's going on. Um, and, and, um, so he said, well, you know, that's not going to happen with us. We're, we're going to, you know, I'm going to be upfront about all the issues that we had. One of the issues that we had was that at that time in 2008, 2010, 
the uh, um, the Ramirez's, uh, they also had a a, a truck, uh, like a type of truck, and and uh, but that was discontinued in in um, you know shortly before 2010 because you know that's when that's when the um, you know we we had the recession and and um, you know the uh, the clientele that they served was not there anymore. Uh, they you know they usually they used to go to construction sites. Um, and you know, so construction came to a stop, and and so there was no, there was you know, there was really not enough business to maintain the truck. So um, you know, the um, uh, so we told them, and I, I explained to them, I said, look, um, I said there is no truck, and besides, for you to have a truck, you have to have a license, and it has to be renewed, and you know, the Department of Health and Services need to you know need, needs to approve that. So that was the first disagreement that we had, and I, and and he just said, "Well, uh, you need to give us, you know, requested information, which we did, and and then finally, you know, you know, he he agreed to to say, okay, well, this additional taxable sales that I thought happened through the truck sale, I'm I'm just going to go ahead and eliminate them, and and um, but once he did that, and we. You know, I start to question his rationale for, uh, you know, for the for the uh, for his findings. Um, you know, we um, uh, that's when we start to kind of disagree, and and I said, okay, well, you know, whatever you, that's fine. I said, but you know, I, I think I have a right to talk to your supervisor, to your manager, supervisor, district supervisor, and and those are the kind of things that didn't happen. Okay only because he ran out of time. And we, we granted him uh, a couple of extensions and he requested another extension and said, look, my, my, my clients just want to get done with this thing. So go ahead and, you know, and, and we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna agree to, to give you uh, an additional extension. So he says, okay, well, then I'm gonna have to finalize the report. I said, fine, if you're gonna find the report, then, then I said, I have, I have a right to meet with uh, with your supervisor, and 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 there were just a lot of delays, you know. And and you know he would come. He started the audit in 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 like September of October 2014, and we didn't get the final report until you know the middle of 2015, maybe towards the uh, towards the end of the summer. And there was a lot of a lot of a, a lot of uh, gaps in between. That we would provide information and then we would not hear from the auditor like a month later or two months later with you know with just no uh, no explanation for that and and uh so you know so that was a problem and in that in that you know we, we just felt that we would kind of just rush to it i mean a lot of a lot of the differences i, I really believe that they could have been worked out and you know, had had he followed through, you know, on a timely basis, and you know, it just it just didn't happen. I mean, so 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 here we are, you know, to, to, to you know, right here, you know, just at this point, you know, having this hearing, we really felt that um, that um, a lot of this could have been could have been uh, um, could have been avoided. Um, the um, the um, so the other thing that I want to talk about, and I just want to give you this, this um, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, brief uh, context because I think it's important because a lot of the a lot of the other findings came from the other findings that that were um, uh, that were reported on, on the first audit, and and you know, every time I ask questions about. You know, we're doing this because that's what we did before. So, you know, we're just kind of being consistent. I said, okay, well, that's if that's what you guys do. Well, that that's what you do. I, that, I'm not going to argue with that. But, but the um, the main thing here, you know, and the reason why we're hearing this hearing is because, um, you know, uh, the main point of contentions that 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 we always maintain is that the data that was being used, okay. Um, uh, to, to uh, you know, to uh, the, the data that was used to to actually um, prepare that the the reports that, that we got, um, you know, we, we thought that 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 data was not 
you know, was not sufficient, was not complete, was not relevant uh, to, to the audit. So, so we're going to talk about that later on. Um, you know, you know, um, your regulations also call that, you know, your audit manual is very specific, you know, how the audits need to be conducted and the type of things that you have to do. And, and uh, you know, we really felt that those audit, audit uh, findings, you know, the, uh, the projections of the, uh, of, of the taxable sales and non-taxable sales, you know, were, were really out of line. That really didn't make any sense for us because, you know, um, you know, those reports actually were saying that, that my clients, you know, uh, you know, were uh, under-reporting uh, taxable sales. And if you're under-reporting taxable sales, then you're reporting, you know, total, total sales, gross sales as well. Um, and then one of the things that, that I noticed that too, that is that, is that every time we got a report uh, from, from the auditor, um, you know, it was a different report, different findings, different amounts, different assumptions, uh, different set of facts. And, and uh, you know, so, you know, I guess, you know, he would just go back and forth to his office and he gets some input from, um, you know, from, from his coworkers or supervisors and then come back with, with a different report. I did a summary, which I, I wasn't able to include on my exhibit, but I can provide this for you guys later on if, you, if, if, that's, if that's acceptable, it's okay. Uh, where, you know, I, I did a summary of, of all these reports that this person issued. And every time we had a, you know, report, that was a different estimated tax liability. The facts didn't change. You know, the, uh, the sample, the EUs were the same. It, it's just the assumptions that we used to come up with markups, with taxable ratios, and all that kind of stuff that he used. Uh, and, you know, very inconsistent, uh, inconsistent actually with what, you know, the first auditor used that for that period, 2008, 2010, and the amounts of the estimated tax liability, liability were all different and you know, all over the map, okay? We started out with $43,000. The second report went up to liability, went up, went up to $51,000. The third report went up to tax liability, went up to $77,000. And then when we appealed it and, and, and the uh, OTA sent it back to, to, to the appeal auditors, then that liability came down to $57,000 and then it went up to $60,000. So every time there was a report issue, the numbers were all different, you know, which is to me, I, I, I really don't understand. That was, you know, there was no additional information. It was just, then working the numbers through. That's that's really I never you know I never seen anything like that. But um, so um, so what I like to do is is take you to um, exhibit uh, what we call exhibit C, which would be exhibit number three. Okay, and and I I just want to review that with the panel. Okay, and and um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how familiar you are with with the case, but I think that letter that I that I wrote to uh, uh, to the Office of Tax Appeals uh, to state our position pretty much lays out, you know, in detail, you know, the issues that specific issues that we had, um, you know, with 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 the uh, with the audit. What has changed? Obviously, this letter was written. Um, before the uh, OTA had an opportunity to, to review this. So the numbers that we talk about here, obviously are not gonna be the same as, 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 you know, as they are now. So the first thing is that I just wanna give you a little bit of content on, on context on, 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 the, uh, on, on, the, on the store, you know, what, what we're talking about. And, and if you don't mind, I'm just gonna read off of this. It's, if that's okay with you. It's fine by me. Okay, great. All right. So the first thing I said is description <laughs> of the store, and and it reads: Kennedy Store in Delhi is a small store owned and operated by Mr. and Mrs. Ramirez. The store is located in a rural and remote area, 
recently annexed by the city of La Quinta. Most of the store customers are farm workers that work and live in the farms and trailer parks that surround the store and construction and service workers that work in the exclusive gated communities that are located near to the store. Many of the residents that live around the store are undocumented families. The physical footprint of the store is very small. The main retail space is approximately 13 feet by 20, 22 feet, with an additional small kitchen that includes a small stove and sink measuring no more than 54 square feet, nine by six feet. The major items sold at the store are beer, sodas, water, candies, chips, ice, groceries, like milk, cheese, eggs, vegetables, fruits, cold sandwiches, ice cream, bacon, and ham. Snacks, pre-cooked pre -cooked burritos and tacos, shrimp cocktails, nachos, and other miscellaneous taxable groceries. And then I, I you know, there were some exhibits that I included, which took pictures of the store, but they, they didn't really come out very good, but it's a very small store. In addition to selling merchandise, the store also has a large check cashing business where payroll checks issued to mostly undocumented workers will be cashed for a fee of one to 2% of the gross payroll amount. This constituted the most profitable activity of the store as hundreds of thousands of dollars were cashed on a monthly basis. The store's ability, and this is important, the store's ability to track inventories for merchandise purchase and sold were minimum, as there were no internal controls over inventories. As a result, the store experienced many losses from daily petty theft perpetuated by customers and employees. The store had one major break-in where a significant amount of merchandise was stolen. And we tried to get the uh, police report to retrieve the police report, but unfortunately we weren't able to you know, to, to get that, um, you know, we're still waiting for that. The hours of operation for the store during the audit period 2011 to 2013 were at 6.30 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. from Monday through Sunday, to Saturday, I'm sorry, and 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. on Sunday. Then I'll talk a little bit about the, the, uh, the audits, prior audit, SBE audit. The store has recently been audited for the audit periods 2008 to 2010, 2011 to 2013, and 2014 and 2016. For every one of these audits, there have been major violations of taxpayers' rights as outlined in the SBA audit manuals that has deprived Mr. and Mrs. Ramirez the opportunity to dispute many of the final findings with the auditor, auditor supervisor, and district supervisor. The worst of these violations include failure to provide final audit reports to Mr. and Mrs. Ramirez for the audit periods 2008, 2010, and 2014 and 2016 on a timely basis, and failure to properly notify taxpayer that a sales tax audit was about to be conducted. This is for the audit period 2014, 2016. This was done it, it, it remotely without telling them that there's an audit being conducted, okay? The most striking characteristic of this audit is that in every audit that was conducted, there was no consistency in the assumptions and facts used by the auditors to arrive to the conclusions. In fact, the markup ratios and sample size used on taxable, non-taxable items and, not, and hot food items were all noticeably different. For the audit period 2008 2010, which was the first one, the final audit report was provided on September 11 of 2014. That's the first time that my client saw a copy of the audit report and that was handed to us at the, uh, at the uh, State Board of Equalization office in Rancho Mirage. And for the audit period 2014 2016, the final audit report was provided on December 11. 2018, after it was phone bill on 10, on October 24, 17. So we provided documentation, you know, to, to you know, to, to corroborate that. What are, what are the disputed, disputed findings, okay? 
sample size and calculation of markup ratios. The auditor used the month of February 2015 to perform his purchase segregation analysis and, and the sales for the month of 2013 to estimate taxable sales for the three year audit period. The State Board of Equalization Audit Manual Chapter 4, Section 0405.20 states that the, that the test space, the test space, should be representative of the total population of the item being tested. This manual further states that when a business has little or no internal controls, the test period should cover a larger proportion of the audit period and the period selected for test should be spread over the entire audit period who, that the sample can be taken for all years and in all seasons of the years. So there were only two samples, one for February 2015 and another one for April 2013. April 2013 were for sales and February 2015 were for, um, for the purchase segregation analysis. We do not believe that the sample size selected by the auditor one month is representative of the entire population subject to the audit. Secondly, the auditor Auditor selected the month of February 2015 to perform his purchase segregation analysis. This is a month that is clearly outside the audit period and should not be used as a basis to calculate ratios of taxable and non taxable sales. We believe and agree with SBE audit manual that information selected for sample testing should be representative and relevant to the population being tested. During our appeal, we presented, this is when we had the appeals conference, we presented purchase segregation analysis information for three months during the audit period. This information was unjustifiably dismissed on the grounds that it was going to be too time consuming to look into all the purchases that were included in the schedules provided. Waited Markup issues can be greatly affected when relevant sample size are not properly selected. We also presented information regarding the variation of the amount of sales throughout the year. Economic activity varies considerably throughout the year in the Coachella Valley. The majority of the Coachella Valley economy is driven by tourism and part-time residents. This was addressed this issue was specifically addressed by information that we provided during that audit. So this is not an issue for us anymore. The other disputed item that we had was projected sales of hot prepared foods. Uh, at this time, uh, the auditor estimated $817,000 roughly in sales of hot prepared food for the three year period, which comes up to an average of $22,721 per month. This amount was based on a purchase aggression analysis performed for the month of February 2015 using a markup rate of 155% of the cost. The markup rate that the auditor originally calculated was 46.85%. That was the original markup. The markup rate was subsequently increased to 155% based on supervisor recommendation. No documentation was provided to support this increase. The $22,721 monthly average for sales of, of prepared hot food seems high when compared to the $13,181 actual sales of hot prepared food for the month of April 2013. Now, one, one uh, important thing about this is that April is the month where, they, where that store made the most money. Because in April, uh, you know, we, we have a whole bunch of uh, events in the Valley uh, that take place very close to where the store was located. And those are the musical festivals, the Coachella Fest and the uh, Stagecoach. And, you know, so that's when whole hundreds of thousands of people come 
and you know, and they they consume, they buy things, you know, from stores that are around the where the event is being held, you know. Um, so so that was really not representative of 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 what happens throughout the year. We believe that the projected sales of hot prepared food to be unreasonable. Most of the hot prepared food reflected in the office projection relate to sales of pre-cooked burritos that were prepared every morning prior to the opening of the business. As tested by the prior sales tax audit, the taxpayers were preparing 50 to 65 burritos every day and selling an average of about 90% of the burritos they prepared. The prior auditor, auditor projected an average of $26,000 of hot food sales per quarter. The, projected, the projection of sales for hot food for this audit period was $68,000. So it's just about triple, you know, from the prior audit to this audit. Nothing else happened, same thing. We pointed out this difference to the auditor and again, the auditor refused to make any adjustments to, to, this, uh, to this projection. Uh, and then uh, the next session, I have analysis of sample of results. Section 0405.20 uh, parenthesis K says that the proposed measure of taxable sales results from the projection of the sample results must be compared, must be compared and analyzed for reasonableness by looking at the taxpayer's business as a whole. This section further states that the auditor and the taxpayer should come to some agreement as to whether or not the results are representative of the business for the time period in question. We discussed this matter with the auditor and presented an analysis of how the projected increase in taxable sales and total sales would have impacted the financial situation of my taxpayers. Um, so based on those numbers, original numbers, the, the uh, you know, the, uh, the increase that we projected based on those, on, 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 on those other numbers were a lot more than what they are now, but you know, they're so significant that would have made a difference on, on my, on my clients, um, uh, financials. Um, there was no. Aside from the auditor's report, there is no evidence that shows that the standard of living of the taxpayers improved dramatically. Instead, when you look at the economic realities of the taxpayers in the audit period, you will find that the taxpayers knew through some serious economic hardships that resulted in a loss of primary residence, increase in debt settlement of past due payroll taxes with the IRS through an offering compromise program. So those are uh, those are the issues that that you know that that, that we that that, that we uh, uh that we identified um the um i talked a little a little bit about exhibits um uh four which is exhibit d for me and there's uh there's exhibit four one exhibit four two exhibit four three exhibit four four and exhibits four five uh which i include copies of all the our reports that were issued uh, by the auditors uh, that were involved in, in the initial audit and the and the, uh, the audit. And again, you know, I prepared a schedule that that basically shows the uh, the different you know results of those audits, and you know, and and um, you know, which I find it very interesting uh, about you know, you know, just because you know, different conclusions and the same set of facts and, and information. So, and, and a lot of has to do, you know, the methodology that, that was being used uh, to, you know, by the auditors to actually prepare those, those auto reports. And, and again, um, um, you know, I, I find it a, a little bit uh, confusing, you know, to, you know, to, to see how things could change from, one report to to the next, but but that that did that did happen. Um, so um, the next thing is is that you know so really the, you know what what we need to deal with is the final audit report that was issued uh, 
uh, by, by Mr. De Pruitt. And, and this happened after we filed our appeal with the OTA and, you know, they were directed, uh, you know, they were directed to, to, to revisit some of the, uh, you know, some of the issues that, that we raised. And as a result of that, you know, we had a, 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 a decrease of, um, of tax liability, almost $20,000. And then for some reason, that liability went up another $3,000, which is not, not really significant to the total scheme of things. But um, the, the main the main problem that, that we that we have that I have with, with this final report is is um, um, how the uh, how the uh, markup ratios were were calculated. Okay, so um, the um, the um, the auditor went back and 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 basically change his position on on what the markup for how prepared foods should be. Uh, he basically um, did away with with the approach that had been taken initially. And then he just took uh, the approach and said, okay, I'm gonna look at the uh, book markup using the uh, you know the uh, information that we provided the financial statements and through the tax returns. Okay, the problem with that is that is that in in in, in making that calculation, he used he used the uh, um, he used the sales for the month of April. Okay, and and he used a combination of the uh, of the uh, purchase segregation analysis for April. 2013 and February 2015. Now, you know, um, when that person's secretion analysis was first performed by the first auditor, he only used one month. Okay. But when this first secretion analysis was done again, he, the auditor, the new auditor, used two months, one for April 2013 and February 2015. Okay. Two different sets of numbers, two different sets of ratios between taxable and non-taxable alignment. I mean, it's a total different period. So we really feel that that if you're going to take a sample, then the sample should be, you know, just like I said it, you know, earlier, it should be from the period that you're auditing, you know, not from an outside period. The information was available, you know, and we actually provided three more months of uh, purchase regression analysis that were within the audit period, and and uh, you know for some reason they refused to look at that. Okay, instead they went one month outside the audit period, you know, to come up with a combination and and you know of of uh, of costs and 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 uh, determination of what was taxable and what was not taxable, you know, to use to prepare this final report. So there is a there is a schedule that that is included on his final report, and that is um, that was used as a basis to come up with the um, you know what the uh, what was taxable and what was non taxable and what was and the ratio between those those. Um, um, uh, those two, those two items, the taxable and non-taxable. So that schedule is uh, R1 12B-1. And what it does is that he starts off with, with uh, purchases made for resale, which were taken from the audited, not audited, from the financial statements that were compiled for Kennedy store. Um, and then he adds supplies and then he comes, comes up with the total purchases made by the business. And then he has a ratio that he used um, to, to calculate, to estimate the, uh, the purchases that were related for the preparation of hot, of hot prepared foods. 
Okay. So when he did the uh, purchase integration analysis, um, you know, he identified what percentage of those two, um, you know, of, of, uh, of food was actually used uh, to uh, prepare, uh, to prepare the hot foods, okay? The problem with that is that when you use those two numbers between April and, and, and uh, February 2015, that average comes out to 15.46%, which is on in the report. But if you just do what, what the original author did, then that percentage comes up to, goes down to 11.82%. Now, a lower percentage is gonna give you a lower amount of, of purchases that were, that were used uh, to estimate how much you purchase, how much you actually purchase in 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 foods that were used to prepare foods, so obviously that's going to impact everything else. Now, um, you know, the other issue that we have with that is that when he performed his purchase segregation analysis, okay, we identified my client went through it and identify, you know, uh, what, what percentage of, of the groceries that were on that purchase regression analysis that my client prepared were actually used for hot prepared foods. The auditor took the position that everything, everything that you, that you, that, that, that you bought, okay, was actually allocated, uh, was used to prepare hot foods, okay? In this calculation, if you go through this, there is no allowance. There's no allowance for waste. There's no allowance at all. I mean, I mean, you, you know, if you, you, you know, if you, you know, ever been involved in cooking anything, you know that not everything that you buy you're going to eat. I mean, there's some stuff that is not that it's not going to be used uh, just simply because when you go through the cooking process, uh, you know, some stuff is going to be wasted because it's not. You know, it's not it's, it's not edible. It's not something that that you want to you know you want to put in your product to sell. There was no allowance for that. Okay, you know, to, to take a position that you know everything you buy, you buy it one you know one pound of meat that you're going to be able to sell it and make burritos out of that. Well, that's not true. That's not going to happen. You know, I mean, uh, you know, you want if you buy one pound of chicken, well, you're not going to eat the bones. I mean, you're going to get rid of the bones. Uh, so, you know, how much of that should be discounted from what you pay? None of that was actually considered. I mean, those are very logical things. I mean, it's like, come on, you know, you got to provide some allowance for that. We discussed that with the, with the auditors. And in fact, we had him here at the office, you know, he was, he was uh, told to come in here and go through those schedules. And unfortunately, that meeting didn't really, didn't go very well. I mean, the, uh, I mean, his, his, uh, um, you know, his behavior was very unprofessional. He was here to disagree with, you know, the input that he was getting with from my, uh, you know, from my client. Uh, we were here for maybe maybe an hour and a half and two hours, and he just he just walked out and left the office, just like that. You know, so when you buy chips. You know, you don't sell the chips. You don't sell nachos, 100% of the nachos. I mean, you're, you know, some of the chips going to the burritos that you're selling. You're not selling the chips. It's complimentary stuff that you provide for, you know, for, you know, for your customers. You know, napkins, uh, salt, and, you know, Just condiments. You know, condiments, things that, that, that go with, you know, with, you don't, you know, you don't uh, salt salts and things like that. You know, you don't sell those things. You just provide that to, to your, you know, to your clients. When you go to a restaurant, a Mexican restaurant, you know, some restaurants do charge you for chips, but most of them, ninety-five percent of them, they don't. They just it's complimentary. Uh, so it's not included on your bill when you when you pay your bill. You know, basket of chips or anything like that. It's just you not even see that. Anyways, so we try to make that, you know, clear. I said, hey, you know, it, this is this is not right. I mean, you you have to make some allowances to come up with what what exactly you're you know you're you're going to use to project sales 
based on cost. I said, you, you know, you just can't use 100%. Anyway, so that was one of the uh, points of potential that, you know, that, that, that we had with, with them. And, and then, and then the, the other, uh, you know, factor in computing your uh, book markup is your sales. Again, we said, look, um, you know, you, you, you're selecting a month that is not representative of, um, of uh, you know, of the entire population. And I said, so obviously your projections are going to be high because, you know, you're using the highest month, you know, of, of, of the year. So that's not, that's not right either. Anyway, so, so that's, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, there's, you know, that, that we're like, uh, if you're not doing your purchase regression analysis correct, and you're not you're not using the the, the base amount for your projecting cells, then your findings are going to be totally out of whack. And that's exactly what you know what what you know what 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 we saw here, and and um, you know and that's that's where we are. I mean, things were corrected to a certain extent, you know, when we went through the OTA, uh, but we still think that that those um, cells. And those projections don't don't reflect what what should be, um, you know, um, you know, on this other report. Um, the uh, part of the exhibits um, include a, a whole bunch of analysis that 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 I prepared to kind of uh, show, you know, uh, the. Um, show the where you know where things are really obvious where those projections are really you know out of line on exhibit um e1 and it's the uh is is i titled it analysis of estimated audited cells of hot prepared food i make a comparison of what was on the report versus an average of sales that I prepared, I went back and I on uh, on um, on exhibit um, um, uh, exhibit five one, which would be uh, E two for my my index. I went back and and I I did a I did exactly what the author did for April, and I took the um, I identified based on the uh, on, on the uh, on the uh, cash register tape. I identified what was sold on on 27 days from the years 2012 and 2013, and and then I I came up with averages, okay, and and then I compared that to what the what the average the daily average was was based on on the audits projections and we find that there was a discrepancy of, of 66 dollars and 18 cents a day okay so when you project that out on on the uh, on the analysis that I perform on on um, on 51 or e1 you see that there's a difference there a significant difference okay first on the auto report, he used the sales for for April 2013, and that was actual sales of hot prepared foods that were recorded on the cash register. That was 13,180. But when he did his audit, okay, and he said, "Oh, this is the uh, the the uh, audit sales for hot prepared foods," that monthly average came out to 15,664 which makes no sense. That average is higher than the actual sales for one month. It's significant, $1,684. When I compare that to the actual sales and I do the same analysis, when I, I do the same comparison, that difference with actual sales, recorded sales, okay, goes up to $3,696. So over a three-year period, that's a difference of $133,000. Just that alone. This is all based on 
factual information. Now, one of the things that 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 um, you should know is that those those cash register teams were audited by the first auditor, okay, and he found no discrepancies at all. Actually, he wrote on his report, everything reconciled, everything's complete based on my audit, my review, you know, you know, basically saying we can rely on this thing, okay? So that's where the information came from. On exhibit um, 5.3 or E3, you know, I went, I went ahead and I summarized all the sales based on the cash receipts for 15 months. This is five quarters, okay? And I noticed, you know, and we identified differences between those takes and, and, uh, and what was reported. And the reason why there was a difference is because I told the first auditor that, that those tapes included voids that, that were not taken out of, out of the totals. There's a, there's, you know, there's a software problem. And my client realized that and, and uh, my client made, um, you know, um, uh, adjustments to reflect the voice. So, um, you know, again, um, you know, that this, 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 this compilations that I prepared didn't take into account the voice that should have not counted or reported as taxable sales, but just using the tapes as, as, as they were generated, uh, we noticed that over 15 month, uh, 15 month and projected out to the entire year, the three year period, we noted there was an, un, an understatement of taxable sales of 26,484. And, you know, we discussed this with the auditor and said, look, um, you know, this is, you know, um, you know, this is not subjective. This is pretty information that you tested and our sample included not just one month, but included 15 months. And so we were ready and proposed um, because we didn't have anything else. Uh, you know, we just couldn't, um, I didn't have the information to see how the, uh, the reports, you know, the uh, monthly cash receipts totals were being adjusted. So I recommended to my client that we should, you know, uh, although they didn't agree with that, I mean, but they accepted it, that we should offer, you know, to settle for $26,000, you know, pay the additional tax liability for $26,000. Hey, Mr. Amijo, I'm just yes. uh, gonna stop you one second. Um, it looks like we lost uh, Mr. Suazo. Yeah, this is Jason Parker. Um, uh, we've been having a little bit of technical difficulties on our side and Mr. Brooks logged out and logged back in a little bit earlier and, and Mr. Squazo just did as well. So some of the transmission has been a little bit choppy and our screens freeze a little bit. So I don't know if anyone else has had the same issues, but all three of us had on our side. Okay. Um, sounds good. Um, I, I don't think I stopped it, uh, Mr. Suazo, so I don't think you missed much uh, from uh, Mr. Armijo's argument. Um, but um, uh, I'll keep an eye out for further drops so we can pause the hearing, um, you know, when necessary. Um, Mr. Armijo, um, since we're, it, it, it's a little bit of a pause, I wanted to let you know that we're at about 50 minutes. Um, so uh, just to, so that you can um, optimize your time however you, you see is best, okay? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just about you know, ready to wrap it up in another 10 minutes. Uh, the next analysis that I performed is, is on, on 5.4 or 8.4. And again, I, did, I made a comparison um, uh, between uh, what was reported and then I prepared uh, a, um, what the sales tax should have been based on the same approach that the uh, original auditor used, which is the book markup with, with uh, 
you know, and and I came out that that difference, that the understatement of of, um, of uh, sales taxes was twenty thousand dollars, one hundred seventy seven dollars, which is pretty close to my other estimate. So you know, I felt pretty pretty confident that felt good about you know seeing that relationship. But the last one is the uh, uh, five uh, exhibit five point five, which is E five. And, and again, I use the numbers from the latest auto report. Um, I, I took the additional taxable merchandise. I came up with the, uh, I used the taxable ratio that was that was uh, reported for the new auto report. And then based on that, I estimated the growth sales uh, per audit. When I compared that to the growth sales for financial statements and tax returns, you know, I came up with a difference of $397,000 or an overstatement of growth sales per year of $132,000. Now, with that additional $132,000, uh, I'm sure that my clients, if that was the case, you know, wouldn't have had to lose the primary home. They wouldn't have to, they wouldn't have qualified for a, a, uh, an offering compromise with the IRS. And, and, uh, and sadly, um, I mean, things didn't really get better for them. So I provided on, on Exhibit 6-1 the, uh, the uh, correspondence and information related to the uh, Internal Revenue Services offering compromise acceptance. So that was, that was accepted. And then uh, just lately, uh, Exhibit 5-2, um, Exhibit F-2 in, in, in my exhibit, it's a proof of uh, order of discharge for Chapter 7. So they filed chapter seven bankruptcy and they, they just got completed not too long ago and basically you know my clients don't own the store anymore because of the uh, bankruptcy um so uh i, I think that that really uh, proves the point that that you know all these estimates and assumptions that's all they that's all they are just they're you know they're just estimates and assumptions and they're not really based on any any you know any factual information and and i think that you know um the auditors really failed to to look at the whole picture just like what you're required to do based on your auto manual that's, that's what you need to do uh you know and and see if, the, if your projections are make any sense didn't make any sense you know uh, as far as my, my clients are concerned and uh, so as a result you know um they paid a hard price for it i mean business were not as we're not as as good. Uh, the uh, cash uh, uh, checking business they had it went away because you know banks were able to they didn't want to do any more uh, two party checks anymore. So you know they so they had to discontinue that. So they really put a a big uh, strain in their finances. Um, you know um, their their. You know, the shelf test that they took, again, they're using information from 2015, which is totally different than what was happening in 2011, 2012, 2013. That's why on my appeal, I just say it's irrelevant because that's not what they were, you know, charging. 2015, the prices they were paying for 2015 for, for goods was much higher than, than what they were paying for in, in 2013. I mean, there's inflation, I mean, you know, None of that was taken into consideration in, you know, or make, you know, to, to really, to make this, this thing a, uh, a, uh, something that was, that would be credible in terms of determining what the cost uh, should be and, and, and what the final number should be on your first segregation analysis. So I think that that's just not, not, not correct. The last thing is I want to talk about negligence. And, and again, uh, last time we spoke, I just told you that I needed to look at exactly how you guys define negligence and, and, and when uh, penalties are allowed to be charged, negligence penalties. And, and again, is, um, you know, my clients, uh, the way you define uh, negligence here is that is, um, this is on your manual. It says that, um, talks about classes of negligence. Uh, negligence, one is in keeping records. Okay, so we're talking about source documentation. 
okay? Uh, cash version tapes, financial statements, the, um, you know, compile financial statements, tax returns, um, checks, bank statements, reconcile reconciliations, stuff that you have to do for a business was all there. It's, it's there, it was available to, to the auditor. And the other one is negligent preparing returns. The returns were prepared on a time basis, timely basis, based on the information that that you know that my client used, um, you know, to, to prepare those tax returns. The only thing that was adjusted from the from the tapes was the uh, the, the uh, penalties that that she identified, and she you know I fully saw she you know she discounted them from from the totals that that uh, that were on on the uh, total monthly and daily cash receipts and, that, and that's what she did um so you know so the information i mean there was there was you know there was uh there were records and you know there was there was uh, um you know the returns were prepared and um you know, and they were used based on on how she understood things needed to be done. Um, you know, I mean, if you're you know, you're not going to always report something that that is not that is not true. If you have voids, I mean, what is the what is the most logical thing to do? Well, you got to find a way to adjust those things because that's not, you know, that's 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 all that would be overstating your yourself. And and again, I I I explained that to the auditor, and I said, and that's when he recommended says, okay, well, let's uh, you're saying that your um, that your records are impeached, so let's do the uh, purchase application analysis. But then when he said that, you know, he said, but I want I want to caution you that if you do that, then your tax liability is going to go up. And I said, well, why is it going to go up? Well, I didn't know how you know data was going to be used, and I know that. You know, then I would have never agreed to do anything like that. But you know, of all the other sales tax audits that I've been involved, it's all you know, it's all being based on, you know, what what um, you know what sales were reported based on the uh, on on the on the records that were obtained from the uh, cash registers that that my you know that that my clients generated off of their you know systems that they use. So. I, I don't understand, you know, about why this this negligence um, penalties are being assessed, and 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 your and your manuals specifically uh, say that that the uh, it says here if a negligence penalty is being recommended, the auditor must provide in clear and concise terms the rationale for imposing a penalty, an explanation of the evidence and facts upon which the auditors relies to support the recommendation for imposition of a penalty must be given. The explanation must be enabled, must enable supervisor, reviewers, the taxpayer, and or the taxpayer representative to determine whether that recommendation is consistent with the facts established by the audit. That never happened. Never happened. Never. Period. But reading what, what's in this audit manual on chapter five, it's, it's clear that that's not applicable because my clients have records, they have records, we made them available, whatever information he requested was provided. You don't see anything on, on, on his war papers that said, well, this information was not provided, none. And neither do you see uh, a, a finding that that the uh, the tax returns were not filed. It's not there. So then, what is the rationale? What is the basis that it was used to to make that that conclusion? And that's the frustrating part of you know uh, for us is that a, a lot of decisions were just made just because you know that's how we do business. Like the markup cost 155 percent. So why where did you come up with that number? You know, you had 44 percent. Now you go up to 155. What's the rationale for that? What's the justification? You know, and and again, yeah, and and the previous auditor was 227 percent. It's like, 
to where you guys are getting this information. But again, it's 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 it seems like that's the practice. And I mean, I you know, as an auditor, I dealt with federal auditors, state auditors, county auditors, IRS auditors, franchise tax board auditors. I dealt with all of them, and it's not like, well, we're just getting this number out the air. It's like, no, there's documentation for that. Um, but here it seems to be very subjective, you know, and 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 it's you know it's very um, you know that the defense is like, well, this is our experience, this is what we see. I don't know if that's okay for you guys. I, I don't think that is. I think it's very unfair to the taxpayer. It's it's not right, and you know, and and um, if we're gonna make conclusions, it's gotta be based on on data that can be corroborated and can be proven. But not cannot be based on your opinion. Cannot be based on how you feel. Cannot be based on, you know, what what, uh, you know, how you feel about the client. You know, just, when you said that you're going to perform an audit in accordance with generally accepted audit standards, you know, you have to use professional judgment and you have to be impartial. You have to be objective. You can't just be biased and say, oh, you know, we're going to go ahead and do this. That's what your manual says. So the question for us is that why why didn't you follow that? You know, the explanation that was given to me is that well, it's going to take too time, too much time to do that. Well, I mean, that's not really my problem. Is is that you got to find the facts, and based on the facts, then you you need to do the report. But don't tell me that that I was selling quotes for two fifty just because you think that it's you know. You think that's that's the number that I should be using, and and unfortunately, you know, we, we really think that that's really what what happened in this, in this in this situation. If you look at my analysis that I performed, they just don't make any sense. Your conclusions don't make any sense at all. And if it was if, if, if that was correct, then my clients wouldn't be losing their home. They wouldn't be able to file for an offering compromise with the IRS. You know what it takes to get an offering compromise approved for the IRS? You know what the approval rate is on the offering compromise? Very small. They check everything out. They look at facts. They're not assuming that you have this and you have that. No, they look at everything. When you go to bankruptcy, you know, same thing. It's yeah, all based on facts. So, uh, I mean, it's very... You know, like, you know, we feel that it's very, very unfair, you know, that, that your findings report don't really reflect the realities of, of, uh, of what's really going on. I mean, it's, you had the records, you could have, the auditors never, ever looked at the uh, financial statements. They never verified the purchases. Never. All the data, data was there. If there was a general ledger with detail. Uh, information, invoices that were paid, everything, check numbers, dates, everything, bank statements, never looked at any of that stuff. But yet they're using it to, you know, to make all their their projections and using it, using it wrong. You know, what if, what if there were misclassifications on 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 purchases and beer and sodas and other groceries and stuff like that. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you, you just, you just can't get stuff that is not there and, and, and use that to, 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 you know, to make some conclusions. But anyway, so that's really my presentation. And, um, I'm not sure if, um, there's anything you want to say? Before? Yeah, I, I just want to add that, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been working there, uh, I was, well, I was affiliated with the store since I was 10 years old. I started working there with my, my grandfather. Um, and uh, I can say that uh, when we first started doing the audits, the first person came, was pregnant, had a complicated pregnancy, and we couldn't finish the audit. She left, didn't hear anything for a couple years, and then... Um, they came back and uh, I was busy in the store as you can, well, I don't know, if you Google the store, if you, um, uh, you'll see it's a small store. 
I was always busy when another auditor came in and said, sign me a paper. Didn't explain it to me. You know, I guess what after I showed it to Mr. Armijo, it was an extension for one of the audits, for another audit period that I, I wasn't even done with one and I'm already getting into another. So this is what I've been dealt with. And then I think in all this audit period, I've gone through five or six auditors. And I never had a complete audit. So, you know, um, all I saw during this whole period was my debt. Um, I, it, it was frustrating. I couldn't, I couldn't get a, I couldn't go to a bank. I can't, you know, the liens were placed, uh, you know, it restricted me on how I did business. Um, it, it really, you know, losing uh, $67,000 of garnishments at that time when it did back in 2009 during a recession killed me. I didn't know what happened. Um, once we started going through everything, I, I didn't receive anything that said, you know, if these auditors would come to you first and show you uh, what your liabilities are. They, they had Mr. Armijo's address. They had my address. Um, I, I, I used to work six days a week, seven days a week in that business. I gave my life to that business and never once did anything ever finalized, but yet I'm here still dealing with the markup. You know, when I realized that it was a 250% markup, the first one, I about, I'm sorry. 220. Oh, 220% markup. I wouldn't have been able to stay in business with a 227 markup. I don't care what I am. 150% markup. The the last one. Please go tell you. I mean, the, the sad thing here is that go tell somebody else to dictate. And, and this is a conversation I had with Frank. This is why he walked out of here. One time we met here. How can you tell me to sell? At a markup of 155 percent i'm not going to have a business so why am i what are we doing here and then he said oh well we use chipotle as a as the as the model and i said chipotle but we're in audit period 2007 2008 2009 there was no chipotle now i'm i'm out there in thermal okay and you know the 90 I couldn't get lottery because 98% of my clientele was Hispanic. The lottery, California lottery wouldn't even give me a lotto machine, lotto, not tickets, lotto, because the demographics were high density Hispanic, low income. So it's like challenge after challenge after challenge and trying to get these things to, to uh, not to go away, to deal move forward so I can move forward, which I never had the opportunity because I'm still not done. Thank you, Mr. Ramirez. Um, does that conclude your uh, witness tes testimony, Ar Mr. Armijo? Yes. Thank you. Um, so now uh, we'll switch over to the department's presentation or the combined opening and closing. Um, Mr. Suazo, are you uh, ready to proceed with that? Ready. Go ahead when ready. The appellants operated Kennedy's store in Delhi, a convenience store that also sells hot food to go. The audit period is from January 1st, 2011 to December 31st, 2013. The appellants have been previously audited. Records reviewed included federal income tax returns for 2011 and 2012. Income statements for the audit period, general ledgers, purchase invoices, and cash register tapes. A comparison of federal income tax returns for 2011 and 2012, along with the income statement of 2013, to appellants reported sales and use tax returns disclosed minimal differences. Exhibit E, page 157. A comparison of recorded sales per federal income tax returns and income statements disclosed low markups considering the appellants sold hot food. It also disclosed fluctuating markups for all three years. Exhibit E, page 157. <clears throat> the appellant requested that a markup audit approach be used because they did not believe their cash register sales were correct. Exhibit A, page 7. 
Exhibit E, pages 123, 130, and 159. A purchase segregation was conducted by the department on appellant's purchases for February 2015. Purchases were categorized into the following groups, beer and wine, carbonated soda, tobacco products, miscellaneous taxable items, phone cards, miscellaneous non-taxable items, food purchases for hot food sales, and tax paid consumable supplies, Exhibit E, pages 152 to 155. The appellant conducted their own purchase segregation categorizing purchases in the same fashion as the department for April 2013, Exhibit D, pages 60 to 85. The, purchase, the two purchase segregations were combined and ratios were developed to determine purchases of taxable items, exempt items, and purchases for the restaurant or uh, for hot food sales. Exhibit D, pages 58 and 59. Shelf tests were conducted to obtain market percentages for beer, carbonated drinks, and tobacco products. Exhibit E, pages 148 to 150. An industry average markup of 50% was applied to miscellaneous taxable items. Using the shelf test results, the department calculated a, a weighted taxable markup of 26.89%. Exhibit D, page 57. Recorded purchases were reduced by supply items and purchases used in making hot prepared food. Adjusted purchases were then multiplied by the taxable purchase segregation per the combined segregation test to arrive at taxable purchases for the convenience store. Taxable purchases were reduced for, two, for pilferage at 2% and self-consumption at 3%. The taxable cost of goods sold was then multiplied by the taxable weighted markup factor to compute taxable sales per convenience store of more than 1.336 million dollars when compared to reported taxable sales of 1.183 million dollars a difference of 153 thousand dollars existed exhibit d page 55. to establish the hot prepared food markup the cash register saves for april 2013 of 13,981 dollars exhibit e page 144 were compared to april 2013 food purchases established by the appellant during their segregation test of $6,758. Exhibit D, page 60. The comparison showed a recorded markup for hot prepared food of 106.88%. Exhibit D, page 54. The markup factor was applied to the audited cost of goods sold used in preparation of hot food sales to establish sales of just under $564,000. Exhibit D, page 53. The taxable self-consumption based on the 3% of taxable purchases of 33,000 was also assessed. Exhibit D, page 86. The combined underreported taxable measure was approximately $750,000. Exhibit D, page 51. The department considers the audited sales of both the convenience store and the hot prepared food portion of the business to be reasonable. The segregation was based on two separate months one of which was performed by the appellant. The weighted markup for taxable items was less than the industry average at 26%. Audit taxable prepared food sales were determined using the same two month purchase segregation to obtain taxable prepared food costs, the goods sold, and applying the appellant's own recorded markup for the month of April, 2013. The prepared food markup used of 106% is well under the industry standard markup. A 10% negligence penalty was applied as records were impeached. The appellant's own cash register tapes showed larger amounts collected than were reported on the sales and use tax returns, Exhibit D, page 97. The appellant had stated due to inadequacy of the sales records, a, market, a markup or audit approach should be used to conduct the audit. This is the appellant's second audit and the same issues noted in the prior audit existed in this audit. The percentage of error on taxable measure is 77%. The 
the additional measure of three quarters of a million dollars is substantial. The appellant failed to correct the issues revealed in the prior audit's findings. Therefore, the department contends that the negligence, negligence penalty is warranted. This concludes our presentation. I am available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Suazo. Um, now we're going to switch gears over to questioning um, from the, um, the panel. Uh, I had a question for Mr. Ramirez or Mrs. Ramirez. Um, so, um, you know, from Mr. Armijo's uh, presentation, it sounds like the month of April was rather busy. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes. And uh, what uh, events, if any, occurred during April? Well, first of all, being an agricultural community, the majority of the crops are getting ready right at April, uh, February planning, and then an, and like an April date to start picking. April is another good month because of the fact that there's a lot of palm trees, a lot of pollination, getting the palm trees ready for harvest. So that's that's another big month. And if you look at the Coachella Valley, it's known for our dates. So where thermal is, the, the density of, of palm trees. So that's the time when there's a lot of work. Also, the seasonal planning of all the, uh, uh, for the, the homeowners that live in the area. So April has historically always been, uh, and then the festivals. The, the festivals are usually in the first week of, the end of March. No, is that, I'm is sorry. The, first, that they, is the second week of April, then the third one. And but the but they start month. getting there's, ready. There's three, there, yeah. There's they three. start getting ready the month before with just maybe, you can imagine there's 150, 100,000, 150,000 people at these events. It takes maybe, you know, how many people to get everything prepared. So we start, you know. The, getting... last, the last week of March, they start the last week of March for, to prepare two weeks for the events, which the event starts the second week of April. And it's their three concerts. Um, the, the Coachella Fest is two weekends. And then, and the and then a country coast. fest. Yeah, uh, the last weekend of April. Please, guys, to please speak one at a time, please. I can't get both of you at the same time. I'm sorry. One at a time. So um, the last week of March, um, they start preparing for the festivals. Aside from what Gilbert said about the crops and everything, yes, the last week of March, then they start, then the concerts start the second week of April and they they go up to the last weekend of April. So yes, April is our, our busiest um, month of the year. Okay. And so in in anticipation of April, did you raise your cigarette prices? No. Did you raise your soda prices? No. Did you raise um, miscellaneous taxable items? No. So really what you would see is an increase in sales, but not necessarily a, a change in the we, markup? Yes. You know, we're, we're a small store and we rely, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to tell you this, maybe he'll be able to tell you, but I'm going to start it. We rely on, on, um, on like, for example, Pepsi, Coke, in, in, in the beer companies uh, that we rely on, on, we buy, let's say two cases and we sell it for what they tell us, which is, uh, I don't know the deal, the two, the two for two, which we, we don't make the money, we, we make the money on, on being able to sell them. How, how does that work? Uh, so what it is, is it, we rely on the we can't change our prices because the the company goes and takes a picture of the window right we kind of try to lock in on contracts and fees so that we can have a, a certain pricing for you know periods of time what the companies do is try to have everybody kind of pay the same thing so there's no fluctuation of prices um uh when there's an event cinco de mayo september 16th um, you know, they, they, they try to keep the standard to everybody come down a little bit. So we never go up. We usually come down for, for events or, or for, uh, uh, special promotions and things like that. You know, that's how they make their money. So 
our 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 um our increase our uh um our what we our markups never changed okay they stayed consistent that's what i was asking and then uh with respect to the um uh the burritos uh were these burritos hot when they were sold actually we would cook them in the morning and we had a warmer we had a electric warmer that we had uh, to keep them at a certain temperature all day that's a standard through the health department okay so and, so and but that was the predominant yes. i'm sorry that was the predominant like hot item or yeah. item that was um under the 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 food warmer Mm -hmm. Yes. Are there other items? No. What? Well, yeah, you that, yeah, that tacos, the burritos, and and the cheese for the nachos. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Um. So I'm gonna switch gears and uh, see if my panel members have more questions for you. Um. Judge Wong, did you have uh, questions for either party? Um. This is Judge Wong. Yeah, I had uh, several, a couple questions for. Um, first for Mr. and Mrs. Ramirez, I just wanted to get a, a sense of your store. It's been described as a convenience store slash deli. Is that correct? No, we just put the deli because we were hoping that one day we would have a deli there. And I bought the sign of uh, buying the future. So I put the deli just to throw it in there. It should have just been Kennedy store. The okay. deli, I just threw it in there for the name. But is there a, is there a kitchen? Part of it where you prepare uh, yeah. the foods. Okay, there, like Mr. Amijo said, there's a, a small, how many square? Feet? 54, 54. 54 square feet. It's just a little window, and it's a electric stove, no hood. You got to remember, this store is built in the 1930s. Okay, it was an Adobe store, um, so the county didn't never allow me to increase size. No, no, no added electrical outlets. So everything that I had to do had to be within that 54 square feet, which is nothing. So it was all just one little, my whole store almost fitted in this whole little room here. So um, it was just a room that I made, put a little window up so that I could sell food out of the store. This is Judge Wong. So there was no seating, is, is, is that correct? No, no. 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 If, oh, you, if yeah. you look at this book case, the bookcase that's there, if you stand it farther back, a little back, that's the size of where I have my burritos. Uh, yeah, not hard, bigger than but that. But there was no seating. No, no seating. seating at indoor all. seating at all. Uh, this is Judge Wong. Is there seating outdoors? No. Everything is There's cash and carry. Yes. This is Judge Wong. So all, all those sales, like burritos, um, Tacos were sold to go. Is that correct? Yes. yes. This is Judge Wong again. Um, I had one question about one item that was mentioned that you sold. It's like described as cocktails, um, either shrimp cocktails or seafood cocktails. Could you describe what that is? It was just a ceviche. Uh, it's just the shrimp with the cocktail sauce, like you would. Uh, that was cold, a cold food. Cold. Yes, a cold food. Okay. When, uh, sorry, go ahead. It, it was just a cold food. It was, uh, uh, just uh, answer your question. yeah, it was a cold food. It was just a, a shrimp with a cocktail sauce. This is Judge Wong. Thank you. Okay. Um, did you charge tax for those? No. no. Okay. Thank you. Um, my next question are for CDTFA. Uh, and it, it's in the, in the decision in the appeals decision, it mentioned that the 80-80 rule um, applied, and I was just, I had a hard time look, um, trying to find where that analysis was in the audit working papers or in the re-audit working papers. Sorry, I, it, go it, ahead. If you go to exhibit uh, E, page 144. Okay, page, uh, exhibit A, exhibit 144. E, page 144. Oh, E, okay. Got it. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, so basically where it says shrimp taco, beef taco, lunch bar, all that, that's all taxed. Okay. That's part of the uh, sum of taxable items on AB, the 55,107, that, mm -hmm. that all adds into it. So there might have been some times where they didn't charge tax because if you look at non-taxable grocery, that's mm -hmm. 22,000, they could have rang it up in there. But if they rang it up separately under those uh, highlighted yellow ones, they're part of the 77,000 in tax or the 55,000 in tax. Okay. So there is tax being charged on those items, even charged tax on the chips and the ice cream. When he separately rang it up, there's a, if he rang it up as mis, as a non-tax food, I believe it is. What's that? Yeah. So 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 I... that's that's one of the reasons I believe he didn't really want to use the uh, the cash register tapes because they were bringing it up as both taxable and non-taxable. So they got no, actually no. got a break on this because what if there was taxable and it's rung up as non-taxable, we didn't use it in the in the calculation for the markup. Because if they sold burritos and they said it was non-taxable, it's not gonna be picked up in that um, whatever that amount was, thirteen thousand nine eighty one, it wouldn't be included in that. So so uh, sorry, this is Judge Wong again. Um, okay, I guess my question, another question I had was about the first 80, so it has to be more than 80% of the seller's grocery receipts are from the sale of food products, and was, and food products I don't think includes, at least based on definition, it doesn't include like carbonated beverages, yeah. whatnot. So does but, but the thing is, it, oh, it's a mute point at this point because uh, what, what they're actually picking up is the thirteen thousand that was taxed. Okay, yeah, my, my question was just whether it's yeah. whether. No, I understand what you're saying, but I'm just saying it's, it's a mute. It's a mute point though because she's they're only picking up the the uh, food that was taxed. Okay, got it. And okay. again, if a burrito was not taxed. And it went into a different ring key, which it probably, which, you know, I don't know if it did or not, but chances are it probably did. It would not have been included in the calculation, which gives them a break. Yeah. So may, may I make a comment, uh, Mr. The other Wong? thing is, the other thing is, is that uh, if you look at what they've, um, when we picked up our difference, 60% of, of our difference is associated with ring errors or not ring errors, um, they're picking up 750,000, I think around 60% 60, 60 of that can be identified as stuff that they had taxed but failed to report. It's going to be in, there's an analysis of that in exhibit F. Ring errors. Not ring errors per se, but stuff that was uh, taxed, but when you compare it to what was reported, and what we picked up, 60% of what we picked up is the unreported tax that they should have reported based on the um, the ring, the register ring up for those five quarters that we had were given uh, register tapes or um, data for. Yeah. This is Judge Wong. Okay, thank you. Um, can, and can if you I want me to, I can show you the exact page. Um, Or maybe it's sir, exhibit. Uh, um, oh, sorry. It might be exhibit. Uh, it might be an exhibit D in the reasonableness test. Yeah. Well, uh, can, can I just make a comment, say something? Uh, uh, Mr. Aldrich, can I say something about that? Hey, Mr. Armijo. Um, Judge Wong, did you want to um, offer uh, Mr. Armijo that opportunity right now, or would you like to continue asking Mr. Suazo some questions? Uh, this is Judge Wong. Uh, yeah, Mr. Armijo, you were going to say something. Uh, well, please yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, that statement that the um, uh, the chew cocktails uh, were being taxed, that's something, that's something that we um, you know, you heard from from the uh, from from uh, Mr. and Mrs. Ramirez that the uh, shrimp cocktails were not taxed. Okay, um, we asked to show 
us, you know, it was like, where did you get this information? Because it's it's a cold item. So clearly, clearly it was not supposed to be taxed and it wasn't taxed. We just heard it from, from Mr. and Mrs. Ramirez. I don't know what uh, Mr. Uh, Juan Rostro looked at, but I, you know, he made a passing comment and, and, and again, um, you know, we said, well, show us where, where, what else did you look at? I mean, you're looking at one day, one month, what are you looking at? And, um, you know, so that never really got resolved. So I, I don't accept the premise that, or the statement that shrimp cocktails uh, were taxed because, you know, it's something that they've been doing for, for a while. Uh, that was not that was not something that was picked up by the previous auditor, um, and and um, you know uh, like I said uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, Mr. Wayne Grosso, which, which was the first auditor, he tested those uh, cash receipt dates for at least two months, and his conclusion that there was no no issues with that. Um, but I don't know I don't know you know exactly. You know where he got that information. I mean, that's that's really that's that you know that's questionable. I don't I don't know what that is. This Judge Wong, uh, thank, uh, thank you. Can I go back uh, to to help you out there on where the item's located at? The sure. 60%? Uh, go ahead. It's located on Exhibit D, page ninety-seven. So they collected for three for five quarters because we couldn't get the first quarter of 13. Sales tax collected was 51,000, reported as 38,000. There's a difference of 12,000. Um, the department assessed 20,000 during that time period. So 60% of that 20, 12,000 from the 20,000 is basically 60% is attributable to just pure tax that they rung up stuff taxable and didn't report it. This is Judge Wong, thank you. Uh, I don't have any other questions at this time. Thanks. Thank you. This is Judge Aldrich. Uh, Judge Long, did you have any questions for either of the parties? Yes, I did have a quest a few questions regarding the markup on the hot food sales. Um, so first, uh, Mr. Suazo, it looks like when the April 2013 um, numbers were incorporated into the audit, the markup percentage went down by 106 point, or went down to 106.88 percent, right? And then was was there any reason though that April was chosen for the re-audit as opposed to any of the other months that were provided during the appeal uh, at CDTFA? Uh, the only thing I had to show was April being the purchase segregation where he was, he was able to do it for us, and the April April sales we have the detail for. So we're able to compare the detail of the sales versus the detail of the purchases. We're actually able to get the, that 15.4% of purchases from both the, um, the February 2015 and the April 2013 to get a 15.4%. And then we're actually able to compare it to the detail of the, uh, of the sales amount there. So we're able to get 106% recorded book markup. Okay. And then... With respect to um, Appellant's contention that April was a busy month, that the volume of sales here wouldn't have affected the calculation of markup because it's just sales over purchases, right? Uh, well, actually, if you look at February of 2015, purchases for the restaurant are a lot higher, which sort of uh, goes against what they're saying. Okay, um, and then so, and in uh, February of 2015, the, the market was actually much higher as well, though it was 155, right? No, it's not 155. It, the, the market they used was uh, an industry markup that they said for that area was 155 for a, a place selling food, uh, hot food to go. Okay. So restaurants are normally going to be around 200 to 250. This is prepared food, basically in the same class. So 106% is well, well below 
cool. any industry average. Even the 155, this this 106 percent is well below that. Okay, and I would like to move to appellant real quickly. Um, I just wanted to ask. So in appellant exhibit three. Um, Mr. Romeo, you wrote that the auditor estimated $817,983 in sales of hot food, hot prepared food for the three year period, which comes out to an average of $22,721.75 per month. This amount was based on a purchase segregation analysis for the month of February 2015 using the markup rate of 155% of cost. Um, however, uh, then you write further down in that same uh, exhibit the $22,721.75 monthly average for sales of that prepared food seems high when compared to the $13,981 actual sales of hot food prepared for the month of April 2013. So I wanted to look at the math on the re audit. On the re audit, the hot food sales worked out to be $563,939 which when compared to, or which works out to approximately $15,664 uh, in sales per month or within $2,000 of the April uh, sales amount. Um, are you asserting then that the markup would be even lower if other months were used in addition? No, the only point that I'm making here is that, is that based on your total projected sales for uh, hot prepared foods, okay? You know, whatever assumptions you use, whatever data you use, that average is higher than the actual sales that the auditors use for that particular, you know, to make that projection. So, and, and we just talked about that in April, you know, that's going to be your highest, you know, highest month. Uh, of every of any month, so when you compare that to the total projected uh, uh, audited uh, sales, taxable sales for hot per food, it's it's you know it, it's higher than 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 the actual sales. So recorded sales, this is the actual recorded sales. So so you know that that just makes no sense, you know. So that's. The first column is based on the auditor's numbers. The second column is based on a further analysis that I prepared when I used 27 days, uh, you know, throughout the audit period, and and looked at the actual sales of of um, of um, hot uh, prepared foods, what they consider to be hot prepared foods, and and uh, and by the way, I included. I included the shrimp cocktails there uh, because that's what, you know, I just wanted to see if there was any relationship between, you know, um, you know, what the auditor found and, and, and then the, the projection that I was making. Um, and, and you see that difference is, is even more, it's 3,696. So I'm just trying to, 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 you know, to compare, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the projection of of uh, of audit sales for hot prepared foods, which was five hundred sixty three thousand for the three year period, to you know to what the actual numbers uh, were based on the auditor's use of one month information, which is the thirteen thousand versus when I when versus my numbers where I used a sample that was you know more representative than just one month of the entire audit period. And, you know, you see that differences are even more. Uh, so, so that only proves the point that, that, that $13,180 that I, that they use is an amount that is not representative of the actual sales for hot prepared foods throughout the year. So whatever projections are going to be made based on this, this uh, inflated number, then you know, then then your projection for the uh, uh, item sales of hot prepared foods is going to be high. I mean, that's just follows logic. Okay, thank you. I don't have any more questions. 
Uh, this is Judge Aldrich. Um, so I guess we're, we're, it's time to turn back to you, Mr. Armijo, to see if you'd like to make a closing statement, uh, rebut something that the department has said, or um, otherwise add anything additional. Well, the only thing that I just want to point out is that is that um, um, is that purchase segregation analysis for February 2015 really have nothing to do with with um, you know with the out of period that is that being you know that, that we're dealing with. Okay, it's outside the out of period, and according to your own manual, that's not representative. Of the of the audit period that is being that is being audited, okay. Now, if you look at what happened in February 15th, okay, and I and I looked, and in and you know and and um, um, you know things changed quite a bit uh, in terms of the in terms of the economy. If you look at the GDP, uh, you know, things picked up quite a bit in 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 2015 compared to what happened in. And uh, you know, in 11, 12, and 13, uh, you know, again, uh, there was there was inflation. Okay, prices are going to go up. So if you're, you know, if you're using those numbers, um, you know that that is that is going to increase your cost, and that's going to impact, uh, you know, the the number that you're using to come up with. You know what percentage of total cost, um, you know, are 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 being used for hot prepared food because you're using a higher, you know, higher prices. Um, so I, I just want to make that clear to the panel that is that is not, you know, that that is that is information that is irrelevant to, uh, you know, to, to the other period. Uh, there was information for, and we make those. Information that information available to them. It says there's information for every year. What do you want? You know, why not pick purchases for, you know, 2011 and 2012 and 2013? Why use you know you know 2015? I, I really don't understand the rationale. And according to your manual, I don't think that's 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 allowable. I mean, that's I mean, I think that in practice is probably what you guys do, but that's not what your manual says you should be doing. You know, the information sample has to be representative of your total population. February 15 has nothing to do with 11, 12, and 13. Nothing to do. Uh, thank you, Mr. Armijo. Um, I wanted to reference back. Uh, you had said that you had prepared some sort of schedule of the changes in the uh, different audit reports. It sounded like you were requesting to submit that, but uh, it's not, it wasn't clear. Uh, are you making right. that request? Yes, I am. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just think that it's it, it it provides some additional context to you know the presentation that I made. Is that the question? Is that why are this you know why are this auto reports changing so much? And okay. and if you look at the uh, if you actually look at the uh, follow the process and look at the uh, the you know, the methodology that the auditors use to come up with the numbers. It's just different stuff, and you know, and that doesn't, you know, why is it changing? I mean, it's so fact or fact. So to be clear, you're, you would be submitting it as a form of argument and not necessarily as a form of, um, as evidence. Is that right? Because it, um, it doesn't sound like it's a supporting documentation. Uh, like it's not an original source document, right? Like it's something that you've compiled. It, I compiled it based on the reports that were issued. So you can trace all those numbers to the reports that that are included on my exhibits, D1 through D5. So uh, I guess the question remains like, uh, for what purpose are you submitting it? Argument or evidence? Uh, I would say it's it's, uh, it's 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 supporting documentation to my presentation about the inconsistencies uh, that that were you know that the auditors used in preparing their you know their reports. I don't know if that makes any difference for for the panel, but uh, you know I, I it's it's just that again um, you know when we talk about you know uh, you know you know auditing. Um, 
you know, um, I mean, you, you, you got to be consistent how you apply principles and how you apply use information. You know, you can't just be okay. moving uh, so, this uh, time. So I, I don't know. But, um, yeah. I guess uh, since you're saying that it's being submitted for as evidence, um, I guess my question is like, is there a reason why it couldn't have been submitted uh, before the December 14th? Um, I, I, I just basically, um, you know, when I was doing my analysis and preparing the exhibits, um, you know, I, I, I wanted to do that and, and you know, and, and I just, basically ran out of time. I mean, that's the only thing. But I thought that would, it, it would enhance, you know, the information that I, you know, that I, that I presented it, you know, just, I mean, I don't know if it's, if it's significant for you guys to see how, you know, how things were done throughout the process. Okay. And then and uh, my next question is for the department. And would you object to Mr. Armijo submitting uh, the additional document? I was going to have Mr. Brooks handle that one. Well, Your Honor, we, we haven't seen the, the information, uh, but uh, if you're saying that it's just repeating information from different exhibits, we would still need some time to respond to it if, in case there's some, you know, some issue that we haven't seen yet. Okay. Um, <laughs> So I haven't seen it either, uh, Mr. Armijo, uh, but um, if you'd like, I can hold the record open. You can submit it, and then I'll give uh, CDTFA some time um, to, um, you know, state its objection or respond. Uh, if not, um, we can close the record today. Uh, which would you prefer, Mr. Armijo? I I I like to submit it. Okay. Um, if it's Alba, if it's permissible, I I like to submit it. I think it, it you know provides some additional information. And is that an accurate um, representation that the numbers on there stem from uh, documents that are already in um, evidence? On file. Yes. Okay. Yes. Totally. Um, so here's what I'll do. Um, I'll prepare uh, post hearing orders that lays out uh, what the briefing schedule is. Uh, so you, can you get it to us in within 30 days? What, what's what's your time frame? I, I can do it, um, you know, within um, obviously with the New Year's, so, but um, within 15 days, I can do that. If that's 15 that's days good. is what you're requesting. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, and since CDTF hasn't seen it before, um, well, how about this? There's a lot of holidays in between now and um, and then, yeah. so we'll give you 30 days. If you get it in sooner, great. Um, if not, that's a hard deadline. And then uh, and CDTFA will have 30 days to respond and state its objection if it has it um, and or otherwise respond to it. Does that work for you? Okay. That works for me. That's fair. All right. Um, so, uh, with that said, uh, the record won't close just yet, uh, but once it does close, the panel will meet and confer and decide the, the case based off of the evidence and the arguments. Um, oh, excuse me, it seems like um, there might be one more question. Uh, Judge Wong, did you have a question uh, to ask one of the parties? This is Judge Wong. Uh, yes, I had a question for um, Mr. Armijo and his clients. So, I just... Um, reviewing the document that Mr. Suazo had referred to earlier in Exhibit D. Um, so basically it's saying that based on taxpayers' own documentation, they collected a certain amount of tax, 51,000, but they only reported 38,000 tax. So I was just wondering why there's this discrepancy. In, um, okay, uh, I'm sorry, you said Exhibit D, my exhibits? No, this is be uh, CDTFA's Exhibit D. Exhibit D? Um, yes, page 97. Page 97. Okay, let, let me just take a look at that. Okay.
Okay, so uh, this page 97, I, I believe um, those numbers are coming from a schedule um, uh, that I prepared. That's on page 98 of the league guide. It's right. a summary of the schedule uh, that I prepared um, um, where I basically compiled all the uh, all the uh, sales, taxable and non-taxable, from the cash register tapes. Okay, and and, um, and 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 basically, we did find that based on those cash register tapes, um, you know, there was an understatement of uh, of taxable sales, and and um, and and. And I, I explained that the reason for that is because the client, when they were preparing the uh, sales tax returns, the uh, cash tapes that they, the cash register tapes that they were using included, the totals included voids that okay. they adjusted out, out of what they reported. But my schedules, uh, you know, did not do that. I basically went up the totals per the uh, the uh, taste from the cash register. So that's why it was a, there was a discrepancy, and you know we basically um, you know made that recommendation that you know twenty seven thousand dollars was actually underreported taxable sales. Tax of, of on un, underreported taxable sales. This is Judge Wong. So you're saying that this. The schedule that you prepared is inaccurate. Is that correct? Is that a question for me? Uh, yes. Oh, okay. For, for, for me. Okay. So no, the schedule that I prepared uh, uh, was correct in that I went off the uh, totals that were reflected on the tapes, on, on, on the tapes that were generated by you know, by their, uh, uh, by the POS system that they, that they use at the store. But that's not what the client used to prepare the uh, sales tax returns. They were adjusting those numbers by the, uh, by the voids that it, that it was recorded on that same tape uh, that, that were generated by their POS system. Uh, and that's what she was reporting. But I, I when I when I when I put this together, um, I, I was not I was not aware of that discrepancy. Why there was a discrepancy? So, you know, it's, I I just went up the totals, the uh, the rough totals that were, you know, that were actually reflected on 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 the tape. So it, it's very possible that that my analysis is is overstating the taxable sales because. I'm not making any adjustments for the voids that that um, you know that that happen. I mean, there's voids all the time, but apparently there's a problem with their software or with the uh, uh, you know with the system they were using that it that it, it, it didn't it didn't back out the voids from the totals. Um, you know, again, I I just I just uh, I just went off of what. You know what has been tested. Uh, your auditor did not identify anything about the voice, so I just said, okay, well, let's let me use that that information because it's already been audited, it's been confirmed, it's been verified, it's been tested. So let me use that. Now, I don't have any documentation to show you, or to, you know, to show anybody that 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 the voice were actually. You know, I don't know what kind of documentation the system generates. It just it's a total on the tape, but I I don't know which transactions were voided. You know, it's just a total. So I, I didn't use that. I just said I'm just going to use the total, and you know that's on the tape. I understand and I explain that to my clients is that it may be that it may be my numbers, my schedule may be overstating total sales, and pro sales and taxable sales because I am not making. An allowance for those voids that that happened throughout the year. So, Judge, this is Judge uh, Wong. Thank, thank you, Mr. Um, Armijo. 
do you refer to it as like an issue with the software? Is that a problem with the record keeping? I'm fine. What happened at that time was the machine that we were using was taking an accumulated total. So when if you voided something, it was still taxing it and removing what you voided, but not the tax. No, it, it did. It, it went, it went to, it, it would add everything. It would show you voids and it'll tell you the amount. But at the end, if you add it, it, it included the voids. It wouldn't, it didn't void it. It would, um, it'll say void, um, but then it will still come up on the bottom. It's not voided. It was doing an accumulative total. Yes. It, wouldn't, it wasn't giving us the actual void on the tape. And even Frank saw that and collaborated it because when you do the numbers, they weren't they weren't adding up even on even on our tickets. So it was something that he caught between all of us when we sat down, and then when we started doing the numbers, that's when we came to what we wanted to do the analysis for the uh, instead of the tape register rolls because we that's why the compromise was in the, the tape registers because it was something that we we were we weren't even aware of it until it was. Until we all saw that that was the problem, that it was giving us a, a total. It acted like it gave us a void, but it was adding a, a, an accumulative total. And it wasn't until that point that we realized that we had been subjected to paying more. So that we didn't want to use that, uh, according to Mr. Armillo, as part of our, our calculations. This is Judge Wong. Thank you. No further questions. Thanks. Judge Long, did you have any questions to follow up? It sounded like you voiced no questions, and that's what I'm going to go with. But um, so um, at this point, I just wanted to thank everyone uh, for your time. The, I'm going to conclude, the, and the hearing calendar for today has concluded. Um, Happy New Year to you all. Um, I'll be issuing those orders after the hearing uh, for the additional briefing schedule. And um, please cut the live stream when you can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.